Welcome to the 111th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Jean-Francois Paquet, who's at Vanderbilt University as an assistant professor since last year. He got his PhD in 2015 at McGill University, had uh, several postdoctoral positions, uh, from 2015 until 2017, he was a postdoc at Stony Brook University. Then he moved on to Duke University, where he was until 2019. Then he spent uh, several years uh, as a research scientist at Duke University and became a faculty uh, last year at Vanderbilt. He's uh, very well known in the field. He is maintainer and support, technical support for the uh, Viscous Hydrodynamics Code Music. Uh, he's the author of uh, Associated Software Manual Simulating uh, Heavy Ion uh, Collisions with Music. Uh, he's also taking very active part in Jetscape collaboration, where he's executive committee member. He's maintainer and technical support for compost, and his research interests are quite wide in relativistic viscous fluid dynamics, many body properties in quantum chromodynamics, hard particle production, perturbative QCD, electromagnetic tomography of collisions, high performance computing, and other things. And today he will be talking about ultra relativistic nuclear collisions as seen through photons. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Jeff. Perfect, thank you. So uh, today I'll be uh, discussing the production of photons in nuclear collisions. I'll start with photons produced in proton-proton collision because they're an important baseline that we need if we want to study photon production in nucleus-nucleus collision or heavy ion collisions. So everybody here is familiar with the idea that if you have a, an object that is heated at a certain temperature, this object will radiate electromagnetic uh, radiation, will, have, uh, will radiate photons um, of certain wavelengths. For example, so this figure here is uh, summarizes the different wavelengths of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, as well as the uh, the name we give to these different wavelengths. And at the bottom here, there's a match with uh, the temperature at which an object will radiate primarily at that wavelength. For example, our body temperature is in the 300 uh, Kelvin, so we tend to radiate mainly in the infrared, while the sun at that's 10,000, around 10,000 Kelvin, radiates a large amount of energy in the visible light, but of course it also radiates around in the, in the vicinity of this visible light. So it also radiates infrared light, which is a source of heat for us on Earth. Um, and it also radiates UV radiation, for example, which is a source of uh, sunburns for us. Um, now, today I'll be really looking at the upper end of this electromagnetic spectrum. And what I mean is I'll be looking at photons of energy that are one GV or higher. Now for context, here I put the energy. So visible light is around one EV, X-rays in the tens of uh, KEVs, uh, kilo electron volts. So we're looking at photons that have an energy a billion times higher than visible light, for example and much higher than, than even um, X-rays. Now, photons are not necessarily produced through thermal radiation. You can have processes that are absolutely not thermal that will produce photons. But if you wanted to produce photons of one GV, um, a significant number of photons of one GV in energy, you would need a temperature that is of the order 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Now, if you do heavy end physics or you've heard multiple talks about heavy end physics, most likely this temperature is something you're familiar with. If you're not, um, just remember this, this number will be coming back to it later. I'll be discussing collisions of nucleus that are primarily performed at Rick and Adelaide Sheet. So Rick, the relativistic heron collider, 
collides protons and nucleus at the center of mass energy per neutron pair in the hundreds of GeV, and the LHC at CERN collides uh, protons and nucleus in the center of mass energy per nucleon pair in the thousands to ten thousands of GeV. So if you remember that we're looking at photons in the GeV range, it means that if you think of a proton-proton collision at, let's say, 200 GeV, you're talking about a photon that would be carrying away percent level energy of the incoming nucleus. So that's a, those are very high energy photons. Now, nuclear collision, the type of nuclear collision we're looking at are highly inelastic. So nucleus are accelerated to um, close the speed of light. They're given kinetic energy that are hundreds to thousand times their, uh, their rest mass energy. So we're talking about ultra, ultra relativistic proton collision and ultra relativistic nucleus collision from the, the magnitude of the kinetic energy that's given to the nucleus before the collision. These nucleus will collide inside uh, detectors. And what the detectors measure is a shower of particle that is coming out of the impact region. So that's what I mean by highly inelastic. Uh, protons and nucleus collisions. Now, there's a lot of information that's being carried by these particles. So what is picked up by detectors is a mix of hadrons, uh, electrons, photons, and so on. I will be focusing on photons today. Um, hadrons do carry a very large amount of energy, but not a very large amount of energy, a very large amount of information. And so you can study heavy end collision purely based on hadronic observables. Today, I will really be focusing on, on the photons. Now, technically speaking, most of the photons or a large number of the photons that are being measured in these extremely inelastic collisions of nucleus, most of those photons are from, um, they're from hadronic decay. So there will be a pi zero, for example, that will be produced in the collision will decay into two photons. These photons are measured by detectors. An eta is produced, decays. And these are a large background. It's, in, it's useful to study those, uh, those hadrons, but in a way, they carry the same information as, or they, they carry information that's very similar to uh, charged hadrons that you can detect directly uh, that are, have a longer uh, lifetime and that you can detect directly. So in a way we're in general, not interested in these photons directly. What we're interested in is any photons that are produced that are not from hadronic decay. So these hadronic decays are well studied, well understood. Here you have a list of different, this is a, a shortened list of the different Hadrons that decay into photons on the time scale that it takes to reach the detector. So they decay before they reach the detector. Um, and uh, you can see the, the decay channel, the branching ratios. Using this information and using either measurements for these hadrons or using um, calculations for these hadrons, you can get a very good estimate of what these different source, what is the contribution of these different hadrons to the photon spectrum. So often these photons will be given the name cocktail photons. Um, and this is the last time in the talk that I'll be discussing about those photons. Uh, the reason is that the, these photons are either isolated or excluded or subtracted experimentally. So all the measurements we'll be looking at already exclude these, uh, these photons. Now, if you forget about those photons, we're looking at um, any other type of photons produced in either proton-proton or nucleus-nucleus collision. And let me start with proton-proton collisions. Now, a word about um, the general geometry of the collision. So we have either a proton or nucleus that's coming from one side, coming from the other side. They collide along this collision axis. Now, at, at the point of impact, if we trace a um, 
a plane transverse the collision axis. That's what we call a transverse plane. And in the middle here, we call this mid rapidity. That's where your, uh, your effectively your z uh, coordinate is zero, your uh, and your rapidity coordinate is zero. So I'll always be discussing during this talk about mid rapidity photons. Uh, photons are produced perpendicularly to the collision axis here. Now that matters because if you're if you look at the massless particle and you're at mid rapidity, there's no distinction between the transverse momentum and the energy. So I'll be using interchangeably the photon energy or the photon PT, the transverse energy, for the talk. This is a measurement. This is the cross section of photons produced as a function of PT, so as a function of the energy. This is a measurement from the Phoenix calibration. So here is how likely it is that you produce photons of a given energy. Now we can broadly divide this figure into two, two regions. Uh, and it's largely based on how well we can compute photons in these different regions. So if you go at low energy, it's difficult to compute photons because some of the techniques that we have, the perturbative techniques are, if not stretch their limits, uh, possibly not applicable, most likely not applicable here. So you have significant non perturbative effects here. Um, there is also limited measurement for those low energy photons. So it's an unusual, well, I don't know if it's unusual, but you were, we're in a situation where both the calculations are difficult to, to make and are very limited and the measurements are limited. So in a way we have limited information about how well we understand this region here in the low energy spectrum. Now, the situation is completely opposite if you go to higher energy, because if you go to higher energy, you're looking at photons that are produced at such high energy that you must have produced them by probing the quarks and the gluons inside your protons and your inside your protons or your nucleus. So photons of this energy can be calculated by thinking that uh, by describing the production of photon as a you have a quark or a gluon that comes from one of the proton, you have a quark and a gluon coming from the other proton, they interact and they will produce a photon. And um, this, these parts are non perturbative uh, function. They're the part-time distribution functions. This part is perturbative. Uh, this is you compute from um, uh, uh, an expansion in the, in the strong coupling uh, using Feynman diagrams. And uh, this, uh, this general idea that you can divide the perturbative and non-perturbative, the perturbative and non-perturbative is, is factorization. And this, this, um, the, this writing of your uh, cross-section in terms of perturbative object, non-perturbative object uh, has a long success in, in collider physics. And in general, th there's, a, there's, a, there's hundreds of different calculation measurements that have been compared. And this works very well. So we can compute, and just a re reminder for everyone that the parton distribution functions are measured in other processes, and then they are used here. Um, so even if we can compute them in general from first principle, we can use uh, other measurements. And if you look at uh, results, so photon production in proton-proton collision have been, has been known at least the next leading order for, um, since, since the late 80s, actually. And there was some calculation that next next leading order nowadays, uh, especially at higher PT. And if you compare this kind of calculation with measurement, you get an excellent agreement. So this curve is one of these next, le next leading order. This is a next leading order calculation. Uh, you can see there's, you can, you can in a way extrapolate your result to low PT. Agreement is reasonable, but in a way, the, the data is not very constraining there. And we know that there's some amount of, there's a fair amount of uncertainty. So we know that we have to be very careful when we extrapolate those calculations to low PT. Now, an important point is that 
Um, when you compute photons this way, there are two different mechanisms that can produce photon and proton proton collision. You can have a, a quark or a gluon coming from each one of your proton, they collide and they produce a photon directly in their final state. You can also have what we call fragmentation photons, where um, you don't produce directly a photon, you produce a gluon and your photon is eventually radiated from this, uh, from this quark or from this gluon in the final state. Now it's important to differentiate them because um, just by their nature, these tend to be lower energy they are just radiated. Uh, they, they tend to carry a smaller amount of energy compared to uh, these ones. So if you look at the, the, the breakdown, this is the total, the line I was showing in the previous plot. And you can see the isolated, the blue one, which is the ones that are produced here in the final state. They tend to be uh, dominant at high PT, but the fragmentation ones tend to be dominant at low PT, so at low photon energy. So in a way, to summarize this, at a high PT, we have a very good theoretical understanding of how photons are produced, how non-decay photons are produced in proton-proton collision. For low energy, we can try to extrapolate those calculations, but we know that the data is limited and we know we have uncertainty there. So that's largely the, the picture, as long as you're looking at inclusive photon production. So you're not looking at correlation between photons and other particles. That's largely the picture in proton-proton collisions. Now, if we look at heavy end collisions, we can start by, um, the first thing to do is we can compare um, what we would expect in, from a simple incoherent superposition of proton-proton collision. And so effectively, we take the calculation I was showing in the previous slide, and we multiply it by a constant, which is you add up how many nucleon-nucleon collision you, are, you would have in a nucleus-nucleus collision. And uh, you get a curve like the one that is shown in uh, orange here, um, here, the band. And so you see that high and for high photon energy in nucleus collision, um, you can describe it very well as this superposition of incoherent proton-proton collision. While at low energy, you get this what, what we see as an enhancement on top of um, what you would expect from this incoherence proposition. So this enhancement here is what I'll be discussing mainly for the rest of this talk. Before I move on, I can pause for a minute in case there's any questions. Okay, so uh, any questions from the audience at this point? I have a simple question that was connected with the distinction between direct and cocktail uh, photons. I understand theoretically how you can easily separate one from the other. I'm a bit uh, confused about uh, ambiguity when you are trying to do it experimentally. So how, how do you separate them? So how can you know if it's coming from a hydrogen DK or not? Right. Um, so the... The methods vary. Um, typically for this kind of measurement, it's a statistical subtraction, subtraction process. So you measure or you estimate your number of pi zero, for example, your number of, of hadrons of, maybe you can go back here. So you, you compute something like this using measurements or a calculation or models of these quantities. Uh, so your spectra of pions, your spectra of etas. And then you use those branching ratios to compute. And then you subtract this from the measurement. And then you have to be very careful with the systematic uncertainty to account for um, any modeling uncertainty you would have. Well, um, I kind of expected you to say this kind of logic. It's logical, of course, but my concern is this. Is this like uh, subtracting lion's share of all the data you will get or and basically getting a just little uh, access or is it really like a small background subtraction and my understanding is it's not a small thing it's a large it's a it's a large subtraction we're, we're talking about subtracting at least 90 percent of the signal right 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 um that's why they, they need to be a that's why these analysis are so are, are so challenging there be there needs to be a very uh, 
careful. So there's a lot of double ratios that are being used to make sure that uncertainties, experimental uncertainties and theoretical uncertainties can cancel. Um, I'm sure my experimental colleague could, could comment more about the, um, the details of the, exp of the uh, systematic uncertainty. Um, it is definitely a very challenging measurement. Yes. Okay. But there's other... been, I, I, should, I should add quickly, there's been a number of measurements by different experiments and also with using different techniques. Um, so I think, I think as time went by, we have more and more confidence as well in those subtraction techniques. Yes. I see, I see. Um, any other questions from the audience? I guess we don't have any other questions at this time, so let's let's move on then. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so as I said, I, I would be discussing the success here. Before I do this, let's focus very briefly on this this high energy range of the of the fold on spectrum. Um, now, in this high energy range, what you can do is you can simply divide out your measurement in nucleus to nucleus collision by your measurement in proton proton collision, and then a scaling factor that accounts for uh, the number of binary collisions, the number of nucleon nucleon collisions you have. And you obtain this ratio that's very close to one. Um, so, again, for high PT photons, uh, the production of photons in heavy collision is in a way very well understood. Uh, we even understand uh, deviations from one that should occur that at the moment are actually difficult to, um, to verify uh, given the accuracy of the photon measurement. But we know there should be, for example, there should be some deviation from one, from what we call the isospin effect, which is a difference between the, uh, the electric charge of a proton and neutron. So difference between the parton, the quark content of a of proton and a neutron. We should have some nuclear effects, which is the difference between having a proton that is um, uh, a free proton and a proton that is bound into a neutron, that is bound into a nucleus. So you expect to have a different quark content between those two. These are quantified with uh, nuclear parton description functions, for example. And there can also be something, there can also be parton energy loss, which I will. Uh, come back to later. Uh, so in general, this at high energy photon production, even a heavy ion collision is very well understood. Now at low energy, the picture is much more complex. The picture is more complex because um, a large number of particles are being produced in heavy ion collision. And you have, you really need to look at this as a many body system. And um, we now have a good model of the different stages of a heavy collision. And what we understand now is that after you nucleus collide, um, you, have, um, you have some um, equilibration phase, and then you have a formation of a quadrant plasma that will expand, cool down, recombine to hadrons. Those hadrons are the ones eventually you pick up in your detectors. Um, but during all this dynamics, you expect that you would produce photons. Um, you can we model this this uh, part of the collision using uh, relativistic viscous hydrodynamics, and we have uh, nowadays very good models that can uh, simulate um, in detail the uh, expansion of the plasma. And I'm I'm showing an example here. This is a the energy density as a function of time. Effectively, it's different cuts in this in time. So this axis is time here. Uh, so we're looking at the plasma as it's expanding, as it's cooling down. Now we can look at, at, this, uh, at these plots of the expansion in a different way. What we can do is we can cut here, uh, take a cut here and plot it as a function of time. And you get a figure like this, which uh, tell you how the energy density is varying as a function of time and as a function of space if you look only at one direction in your transverse plane. And so what you can see, what I highlighted here is that uh, 
if you had high density, you expect that you have really a deconfined uh, plasma of quarks and gluons. They are strongly interacting quarks and gluons, but you have quarks and gluons. For a lot of the evolution, you're in this intermediate region, this crossover region between hadrons and quarks and gluons, where your quarks are reconfining or recombining into hadrons. And at low energy density, you have uh, fully combined back into hadrons. Now, if I, if I make a connection first with the, the photons that we've been discussing up to now, which are prompt photons, those photons are coming from the initial collisions of the, uh, of, of the quarks from each, each protons, each nucleus. Um, the fact that you have a plasma in between is already, um, is already a modification of what you expect to get at low PT for your PROM photon. So from photon produced through this mechanism. So what's happening is that if you produce a photons, what I call isolated photon, which is you have a quark and a gluon colliding, they produce directly a photon, that photon can escape directly. Um, the main free part of this photon is long in the plasma. It will escape, it can be measured. The challenge is if you have a, a photon that's radiated later by a, uh, from a quark, from a final state quark or final state gluon, uh, this quark will have interacted with the medium. So the quark will propagate. As it propagates, it will radiate a little more photons than it would do in, um, in vacuum, but it will also eventually have less energy at the end to convert into photons. So there's a, there's a non-trivial modification of your fragmentation photons when you're in a heavy end collision. Now, this is actually very challenging to compute. There's been limited number of recent studies, but uh, I'd like to point out this one uh, that was published just a couple months ago by uh, the McGill group. Uh, so there's efforts to better understand how photons produced through this mechanism are modified. Now, let me just point out, this is, this is the same thing as the parton energy loss that everybody talks about, jet energy loss that everybody talks about, in heavy end collision. It's just that it's focusing on the production of photons that's originating from this part on energy loss. Jean-François, we have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, John. Uh, hi. I wanted to ask, uh, what is the percentage of this isolated uh, photons and the fragmentation means, the photons which is uh, downstairs? Means what is the percentage coming from here and what is the percentage coming from the other group right. process? So the breakdown is the, so the isolated is the blue line here and the fragmentation is a black line here. So you can see that at high photon energy, most photons are isolated photons, so isolated or dominant. Um, at low energy, most photons are fragmentation photons. Um, and you can see it, it changes significantly if you're at RIC and if you're at DLHC. If you're at DLHC, um, even at 10 GeV, you're still dominated by fragmentation photons, while your isolated photons are a relatively small number uh, at the LHC. Um, yes, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thanks. All right. So I've been discussing uh, prompt photons, which are those photons coming from the initial impact of nucleus. Because the quark gluon plasma is charged, uh, this, the, the hadrons are charged, this gas of hadrons are charged, you expect to have photons produced throughout the expansion of the plasma. Um, how much photons is emitted depends on the temperature, and the, the energy distribution will depend as well on the uh, Doppler shift that each one of these um, part of the fluid is, is uh, undergoing. So I'll be discussing this in more detail. So the way we compute photons produced by the plasma itself is first you need a, a space-time description of your plasma. So here, as I said earlier, I'm describing the plasma using hydrodynamics. So hydrodynamics gives us an energy density uh, distribution and a flow velocity distribution for this plasma. Here, I'm not showing the flow velocity, um, but you can see the indirect impact of flow velocity 
from the fact that your plasma uh, is expanding in a transverse direction. So it's expanding because you have a flow velocity um, along this axis. Uh, so along the x-axis, radiating out from zero. And the question is how much photon is emitted? So if you have this uh, energy density distribution and this flow velocity distribution, what you need to know is uh, how much how much a gas of photon at a given temperature will ready, how much photon will be radiated. Now let me highlight something that is very important, which is that there's no clear separation between quark and gluons and hadrons here. So this crossover region is in between, but there's no, we cannot necessarily talk about the photon, uh, a partonic photon rate and a hadronic photon rate um, in this region. There's no clear distinction. So that's something important to remember. From this energy density distribution, you can obtain a temperature distribution. So the temperature range we're looking at is um, in the um, maybe five, 600 uh, GeV uh, temperature at very high, very early time. And rapidly you go in a crossover where your temperature is uh, somewhere between 150 and, and 200 MeV. And at low, here I'm still showing the temperature that corresponds to those low densities, but you have to understand that when the density is low enough, the concept of temperature is not necessarily well-defined because your plasma can't necessarily maintain equilibrium there. Um, so um, I'm just for showing it for illustration at those low temperatures. To know what the photon emission rate, you, this is something that we'd like to compute from first principles from quantum coordinate dynamics. It's something that a number of groups have worked on for many years. And we now have uh, we now have good constraints on what this photon emission rate is. Now the calculations that we use depend on the temperature of the plasma. So if your plasma is at low temperature, you'll want to use a hadronic model to describe photon emission. If the plasma is at very high temperature, you can use perturbative finite temperature perturbative techniques. Um, if your plasma is more in this intermediate temperature range that we probe in heavy collision. Uh, you have to either extrapolate the photon rate from each limit, uh, so from the low temperature and high temperature limit, just something many groups do, including uh, the calculation you'll see today. Um, there's, there's a lot of efforts right now trying to uh, use lattice QCD to try to constrain the photon emission rate. Um, there's been work using ADS-CFT or holography, and there's been different effective models as well. Um, if you combine these first principle uh, photon emission rate with the, with the profile of a plasma that comes from hydrodynamics, you can compute what is um, the, how much photon is produced uh, in, in heavy end collisions. So here I'm showing a calculation from a recent publication with my collaborators. Uh, the data is from Phoenix and Star. These are gold gold collision at 200 GV, and they're relatively central collisions uh, where the nucleus overlaps significantly. The, the dashed line is the combination of isolated and fragmentation photon um, that we try to compute as well as we can at low PT and that are dominant at high PT. Uh, the thermal and pre-equilibrium photons are. Here, it's somewhat of an arbitrary distinction. Um, pre equilibrium photons are those photons that are produced at very early time. And uh, what we call thermal photons are those produced uh, after this, um, this, after a time of, technically it's 0.8 Fermi. And it's produced in this region of the plasma. Now, there's a lot of information on the plot. Let me walk you through. So, so the prom, as I said, the dominated high PT, which is what we discussed already. Um, pre photons, they have a window between maybe three and six uh, GV, where they're not dominant, but they're significant. And the thermal photons tend to dominate at low PT. Uh, so if you remember this excess of photon that we're seeing, so this band here is somewhat the equivalent of the PROM photons of the gray line. And um, we're filling up the, the space between the points and this, this band using the, um, the thermal photons are filling up this band. 
Now, if you want to see better the, um, the agreement with data, here we show the ratio of uh, the, the sum of these contribution to the data. Uh, it's the data over the calculation. And you can see here that, see we get very good agreement with the star measurement. We get some more tension with the Phoenix measurement. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tension in the measurement that's still being investigated by, um, by the experimental collaborations. There's measurements at the LHC as well. The LHC collaboration has measured um, photons in a relatively broad range of uh, energy. Again, you see that the prompt photons, they dominate at high PT, at high energy. Uh, thermal photons, they dominate at low energy. And you have those uh, early premium photons that they tend to contribute in the intermediate region here. Um, now, one thing I should emphasize here is that uh, a number of different mechanisms have been uh, proposed to produce photons. Um, what I'm showing here is maybe what we could call more conventional um, sources, where the prompt photons, in a way, are relatively strongly constrained, at least at high PT, by proton proton calculations, by proton proton measurement and uh, perturbative calculation. Thermal photons are again relatively well constrained from the hydro profile we have and the first principle photon emission rate that we have. There's evidently uncertainty in the photon emission rate, there's some uncertainty in the hydrodynamics, but we do have a significant amount of constraint. Um, other uh, other uh, mechanisms are being suggested and are being investigated. So um, I, I also want you to take away that there could be other sources, although uh, we do see a reasonable agreement with data only with conventional sources. Now, one thing I, I, I'd like to spend time on um, is um, this, so the thermal photons here. So if you look at low PT, because your thermal photons, as you can see, they have a different uh, energy dependence than your other sources of photons. So the, the prompt photons, they tend to have a softer spectra. Um, and often, experimental collaboration will, um, will fit this exponential dependence of the photon spectra, and they will extract a slope. The idea being that um, if you think of those photons as being radiated thermally, they should have a dependence that is something like an exponential of minus the photon energy over the temperature of the plasma. And the type of temperature, the, if you fit this, you extract temperatures. Uh, this is a measurement from Alice. And uh, the temperature you get is around 304 MeV. Now remember that, in a way, we know what the, um, if I scroll back here, we, ha well, we have an energy uh, density and a temperature profile. So in a way, our models are already telling us uh, what the temperature profiles, what the temperature profile is, and um, the result that you get for thermal photon is quite a convol convoluted um, sum over all these different regions of plasma which have a, which emits photon at a different rate because they have a different temperature. They have do different Doppler shifts. So effectively, what you have in the end is in this effective temperature is quite a complicated convolution of all this information. Now, there's been a fair amount of interest in trying to better understand how model dependent, uh, or if there's a way with less model dependence to, to uh, provide a meaning for this effective uh, temperature. Um, the, 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 these type of effective uh, temperature have been extracted by other experiments. This is from uh, the Phoenix collaboration at, at RIC. So these are gold gold collisions. And you can see that if uh, they're extracting as well, depending on the range of photon energy they're fitting, they're extracting um, effective temperature that are between 250 and 400 MeV. Now, how can we connect these effective, uh, how can we make sense of these effective um, temperature? Now, this, there's already been a lot of work that I'll be quoting, and I'll be adding some of my own work and some um, 
um, some additional comment on, on perhaps some misunderstanding. So again, you have to remember that the photons are being produced um, throughout, throughout the collision. So you're adding up all these different, in a way, all these different cells produce photons. They have different temperatures, they have different flow velocities. And um, the flow velocity starts relatively small, but it increases with time, which again, you can see in the, by the fact that your plasma for a while is not expanding in the transverse plane. But after a certain amount of time, the transverse expansion is significant. So you start with maybe um, here, maybe a, uh, this is, let's see, 0.3. So maybe you have six Fermi of radius here. And by the time you hit, uh, by the time uh, you have, you, by, by the time you have 10 Fermi of expansion of your plasma, uh, your, your radius is about 20 Fermi. So you have this significant expansion from the transverse, uh, from the this significant effect from the transverse expansion. Now, if we try to uh, simply try to match what is this effective temperature by um, trying to look on the log plot at this um, the the signal that you would get from thermal photons. Um, you can necessarily simplify easily this, this expression. So again, you integrate over space and time, you have a full time emission rate, each different region of space and time of the temperature, flow velocity. Um, so you'll get a complicated result that, that where this T is not necessarily directly connected with this T. Now there's the Doppler shift that is also a significant challenge. So this Doppler shift can be summarized as um, if your flow velocity is, um, so if your plasma is at rest, what enters in your photon emission rate? So your photon emission rate is approximately exponential. So what enters in your photon emission rate if you're at rest is um, just the energy. But if you have some uh, expansion, you will have some, um, some modification of your energy that's coming from this uh, flow. Now, depending on where you are in the plasma and uh, the, the angular direction and the rapidity, you will get a different amount of, of Doppler shift. Now, if you assume that the photon emission rate is approximately exponential, you can work out some formula to, to estimate what's the effect of the Doppler shift. So for example, if your plasma here is going at, uh, it has a transverse flow velocity, has a certain transverse flow velocity, what you expect is that it will look as if the plasma temperature is higher than it actually is. Uh, so uh, a, um, so in a way the effective, so if you define this as an effective temperature, the higher your velocity, your flow, your transverse flow velocity, the higher your effective temperature. Now you also see that the higher your energy, the more sensitive you are to this. Um, so let me, this is a lot of information. Let me put this in context with um, numerical calculation. So early in your collision, your, your nucleus just collided and all the energy was in the transverse, was in the longitudinal direction, which means they don't have a lot of uh, velocity in the transverse plane. So initially, you don't have a lot of transverse energy. You don't have a lot of initial, uh, initial Doppler shift. So if you just look at photons being produced at high temperature, so at early time, these photons, whether you set this, this transverse flow velocity to zero or not, you get almost the same result. So the, the dot or if you have, an, if you set the transverse flow velocity to zero, and the line is if you have the proper Doppler shift. So it's the difference between having no Doppler, turning off the Doppler shift or having Doppler shift. Um, if you have, so you can see that for, for photons produced at high temperature, Doppler shift is small. And as you lower in temperature, so green is lower temperature, you can see a larger effect of Doppler shift. And if you go to temperatures that are uh, the temperature you have when you reach maybe uh, five Fermi of evolution, you have a huge Doppler shift at, 
at high for high photon. So it's the difference between the black line and the and the points here. Remember, this is a log plot. So you can have a factor of 10, 100 Doppler shift at these energies. Now, this has been quantified. There's there's been a number of studies in the past as that have looked at this. Um, what you can do is that you can look locally in your plasma. You can look at a cell and you look at the actual temperature of the cell. And then you look at what the photon spectrum looks like. If So what would be the effective temperature that would match um, the combination of temperature and Doppler shift that you have in, in this cell? So what you can see is that at high temperature, just like here at high temperature, um, and you can look at, at the red points here, uh, the, the difference is not relevant for what you we're doing here, the difference between the points. Um, if you look at the red points here at high temperature, um, you have a um, almost perfect matching between the temperature that you're measuring and the temperature of the actual um, of the actual plasma. So the effect of Doppler shift is negligible here, or it's small. As you go to lower temperature, the even if your temperature is dropping, your effective temperature is, is plateauing because of this Doppler shift. So clearly, this Doppler shift should have should have a significant effect when we're trying to extract the temperature from the fold, extract the temperature of the plasma from the photon spectrum. Now, it's, it's more subtle than this. It's more subtle than this because you have to take a look at where the photons are contributed. So photons at high energy are produced at high temperature. Photons at low energy are mainly produced at low temperature. Now, that means that if you have a huge Doppler shift, for photons produced at low temperature, it, it, it matters only if those photons are dominant in this range of energy. So you can see here that the high temperature photons are dominant at high energy and they have low Doppler shift and the low energy photons are dominant at low energy, but the Doppler shift at low energy is small. It's just a factor of, if I go back to this formula, it's a question of how much your, um, um, how much your energy is amplifying is amplifying the effect of the Doppler shift. So at low energy, you're not really amplifying your Doppler shift, which means that in the end, if you sum all of this together, the effect of the Doppler shift is, is not negligible, but we're not talking about this factor of, of tens or hundreds that we see on this plot here. So we have to distinguish the local effect of Doppler shift, the global effect of Doppler shift. And the global effect is not negligible, but it's certainly not a um, certainly not a um, a. It's not as large of an effect as it might look if you look at uh, results like this or results like this. Um, so we have to understand it's an important effect, but it's not as important as or it's not as large as it might look um, uh, from from. Um, from looking at a certain specific results. Um, another way of looking at this is to, um, is to look at simulation where you, um, if you assume that early in your collision, you have no transverse flow at all, which, is, uh, which you can simulate in much more simply than the, the larger scale simulation I've been showing. Uh, what you would expect is since you're dominated by high energy, high temperature photon emission, and those have no Doppler shift, you expect no Doppler shift at, at high energy, but you also expect no Doppler shift at low energy. So you expect only Doppler shift to, to uh, have an impact uh, somewhere between maybe one GV and three GV. So, so my, my bigger point is that we shouldn't always think of Doppler shift as an effect that is just magnified as you go to higher energy. There's, there's a number of different effects that are, uh, that are entering. And uh, we should remember that the, the Doppler shift that matters will have different origin. Uh, the Doppler shift that will matter for photons that are produced at lower energy are really from the expansion of the plasma. But if you're at very high energy, the Doppler shift that matters is any Doppler shift that you had from fluctuation early in the collision. 
And those have different origin, and it's a way to study um, the early stage of plasma using photons. Now, the other thing that we have to take into account is that um, even without the blur shift, if you're trying to measure the temperature of the plasma, you have to define what you mean by the temperature of the plasma, because obviously there is a, a profile of temperature. So perhaps you're trying to measure some average of it. Perhaps you're trying to measure the maximum. And to better define this, there's a way to use simplified models um, to see what's the relation in those simplified models between um, the, temp the, the maximum temperature of the plasma and the temperature that you would be measuring from the photons. So here at the top, right corner is a realistic simulation, a state-of-the-art simulation of what your, quadrant, your temperature profile looks like as a function of time. As you can see, it's highly non-trivial. And um, if we want to, to use simple toy models to mimic it, a simple toy model is simply to say that you have a certain uh, cool down of your plasma that is uh, from uh, it's, it's, from the trans, it's from the longitudinal expa expansion of the plasma, is what we call Birkin expansion. And uh, the simplest possible model of your plasma in terms of different slices of temperature is just to assume that you have a slab here of plasma and it just cools down with time. And as you can see, it's a significant simplification to what's at, at, to at the top here, but it captures some of the effect of uh, the dropping temperature. If you want to do something a little more uh, realistic, perhaps you want to make sure that you have a profile of your plasma in the transverse direction. So you want to make sure that the, the central part is hotter than the edge, and then you have a decrease of temperature with time. Again, this is a model that is reasonable at early time, uh, but very rapidly, because it doesn't account for the transverse expansion, it becomes a very, it becomes a very poor model at later time. But using this, we can already get a sense of the connection between, uh, the, between the temperature and the temperature of the actual maximum temperature of the plasma and what you would measure by simply looking at a photon, um, at the photon spectrum. Uh, so if you work out the math, we have, we have a paper uh, out about this. Uh, you can see that if you, if you make this uh, simple approximation, this, this simple, in a way, black disk that's cooling down. Um, you, you do expect that you get a minus energy. You do expect um, an exponential dependence of your spectra, but there are log corrections to it that are related to the ratio of the maximum temperature of the plasma to the energy of the plasma. Now, if you do an even more realistic case where you have this Gaussian profile, you get a different, uh, you get a different prefactor here. So effectively, um, if you want to relate this formula, which you can get from these simple cases to uh, the effective temperature, what you find is that your actual temperature of the plasma is some combination of the effective temperature and some ratio of the effective temperature over the energy of your photon. And you have some factor here that would be five half in, in this case, three half in this case. So if we look at this here, um, these are, if we go back to these extraction, the, these measurements of this effective temperature um, from the photon spectra in gold-gold collision, this effective temperature here that was extracted in central gold-gold collision was um, 428 MeV. And if you try to use this, this uh, simple formula, to try to account for the fact that you have different slices of different regions of temperature contributing to it. Um, you, get, you get, as you expect, a higher maximum temperature for it. So what you should understand is that this effective temperature is not a measure of, even in simple models, it's not a measure of the maximum temperature of the plasma. It's an average that you can, um, depending on the scenario, you can define well. And in this, in this simplified scenario, you get, um, you get a temperature that's actually not that different from the temperature that you have in numerical simulation at, at early time. 
Um, now this is the part of the talk I wanted to I wanted the most to go through. Um, to come back to the first slide that I had, um, to produce uh, photons of uh, an energy of one GeV, you would expect that you in temperature of 10 to 12 Kelvin, which are uh, the equivalent in Kelvin of, of temperatures of five, 600 MeV. So we have, um, we have evidence and we have a nice experimental measurement that, that indicate that we are seeing photon, thermal photon emission um, that is much higher in temperature that we've ever uh, been able to measure in, in any other type of experiment. So we're seeing black body radiation from, um, from quark gluon plasma and we're measuring temperatures that are in the 10 to 12 Kelvin range. Um, I think I will stop here and take questions. I'm happy to cover some material that I haven't covered yet. Um, and if there's any question, uh, I will just summarize by saying that in, in a proton proton collision, we understand very well the production of photons, at least at high energy. Low energy, it's still, it's still challenging. In heavy ion collisions, again, at high energy, we understand it well. At low energy, we have this, um, this incredible observation that we're seeing thermal radiation at a temperature that we uh, never thought we would be able to achieve in experiment. Um, temperatures that are uh, orders of magnitude uh, higher than anything that's been seen in, um, that's been seen in, in experiment. Um, I focus on the temperature here. Um, obviously, photons have, um, there's a lot that we can do with photons. Uh, the benefit of photons, which uh, contrasts, which must be contrasted with hadrons, that photons are sensitive to, to the entire uh, space-time evolution of your plasma, while hadrons have an indirect sensitivity to it, uh, which means that uh, photons really uh, give us a way to do multi-messenger uh, study of heavy end collision. Uh, there's there's work that's been that's been done. There's more more work that's being done. I should emphasize as well. Dileptons have uh, a lot of potential. Not being explored as well as multi fidelity um, observables for to better understand heavy end collisions. So let me stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Now let's have questions, and if you have a question, please raise the hand. I see one raised hand. Uh, Georgia, go ahead, please. Um, hi. Uh, hi thanks for the great overview. In a word, uh, what happened to photon HBT? Because I remember a few years ago it was considered to be very promising. I think I think people are still hoping to uh, to uh, me uh, to measure it, and there's been there's been calculation over the past couple of years. Uh, there's been a calculation. In, in Germany, I think was among the more more recent one in Heidelberg. Um, I have to say, experimentally, I don't remember what's the status. Uh, obviously, photon measurements themselves are very challenging. So, photon HBT is um, is, is is quite a challenge to measure as well. I uh, the, I know the Alice collaboration was working on it. I'd have to I'd have to ask uh, my Alice colleagues uh, what's the status at the moment. Okay. okay um, actually, there is some other question which uh, the speaker cannot ask because of the problems with the microphone or something. So let me read that. Um, can we use Glauber model to know more about photons after the collision, just like we find electromagnetic field in Glauber model? Unfortunately, I cannot clarify anything, just reading it. Right. Um... I, I think perhaps the question is about um, alternative sources. So I mentioned that um, what I've been discussing today are perhaps what we can call the more conventional sources of photons that um, have direct connection with the more standard model of heavy end collisions. Um, so we have more constraints on these sources and so on. There might be other sources. If you want to understand the effect of possible photons produced by 
early magnetic field and so on. I'm, I'm sure you can use it lava. I'm sure you can use lava models to to better understand this. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Actually, I have a question myself, and it, uh, in the summary, on the summary page, you actually showed something that you didn't talk much about, uh, the V2 uh, graph. And um, I was wondering if you could give at least a few comments about that in terms of where we stand and what is the, the issue there, the main issue, because we obviously seem to have a difference between the uh, data there and the theoretical models. Right, so the V2 has always been the challenge. So, so in a way, photons are very different from hadronic absorbable because hadronic absorbable, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of them. While photons, we have the spectra, which I've been focusing on today, and we have the V2, and there, there's efforts to measure the HPT, for example, but we have a relatively small number of published results. Um, I think in general, the, the agreement it is it's still challenging to get the spectra and the V2 at the same time, which is the aim. So the V2, for people less familiar with it, it's the, if you look at the photon, instead of averaging the photon spectra in, um, in the azimuthal angle, you look at its, um, at its angular distribution. So V2 would be, roughly speaking, the, the first, the, the second moment of this expansion. Um, so the calculation I'm showing here are, are the, the latest calculation that we have. Um, you can, you don't necessarily need to look at the chemical, uh, chemical equilibration time dependence, but you can see in general, um, the measurements have large uncertainty. The calculation tend to underestimate the measurement. Um, in general, agreement is better with at least measurement, both for the spectra and for the V2. Um, okay, it, it depends what if, we, if we're talking about Phoenix or star, uh, but the uncertainties, as you can see, are large. So I think there's there's still efforts both from the experimental and theoretical, theoretical community to quantify the uncertainty for the experiment, but also quantify the uncertainty of the theory. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons I ask is that um, my collaborator and I were actually looking at the possible effect of the magnetic field. And essentially, in two words, uh, the, uh, the emission that is uh, giving you large positive V2 would be consistent if you have a magnetic field out of the reaction plane. And in fact, that field doesn't even have to be very strong can be relatively weak and you would get a substantial V2 for large energy photons. Uh, how realistic do you think that might be? As I said, there's, um, there's, there's a number of different scenarios that have been explored as additional sources of photons. Um, I would imagine the question is, uh, I think having a large V2 was really a challenge, I think, for many of the mechanism, because I think many mechanisms, they could get, they could get, they could get a decent fold on spectra, but often the V2 would be small. Um, the question I'd have is it, it really depends in what energy range um, you have. So in a way you need, you need to see how much control you have over the overall normalization of, of the sources of photon. So if it's dominant over most of the range, or if it's a significant contribution over most of the range, it will contribute to V2. If, and if you have a large uncertainty on, on the overall normalization and the calculation, then it becomes a challenge because if, um, in a way, the V2 at fixed V2, if you change your, uh, your, your contribution to the spectrum by a factor of two, you will have a huge effect on the V2. Um, so it's not necessarily the, the size of the V2. It's certainly important to have a fine V2, but how, how much you trust your calculation and how well you can normalize it compared to the other sources. Right, right, right. Okay, I guess it's fair. Any other questions from the audience? Any other questions?
I don't see any raised hand. So let me go through the list of questions that I had uh, along the way. Um, so then related question is, um, and maybe you kind of almost answered that, but I'm not sure if I fully caught the idea, the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect would of course uh, be also uh, modifying V2. Is it qualitatively clear that how the Doppler effect uh, affects uh, V2? Is it at least in the right direction? Right, so V2 is purely from, from this Doppler effect. Uh, V2 is effectively, so maybe if I go back to, so on this plot, I was trying to contrast any transverse flow you would have, any Doppler shift you would have from purely initial fluctuation and any Doppler shift that you would have from the expansion of the plasma. Right. Now what you want, so the challenge with Doppler shift from initial fluctuation is that it will boost your, so you'll have a Doppler shift, so it will modify your spectra, but it does not necessarily produce a large V2 because you don't necessarily have a correlation between, what you need is a correlation between the, the a general, you need a general correlation between direction and uh, the the final the, the let's say the final geometry of your um, well let's okay let, let me find I'm not explaining I, I have a figure to explain this better so right so so the v two is really coming from this correlation in the geometry um, and what you, what you need is really a contribution of v two that is um, that is a global, not just a local, a local boost. Uh, so the V2 is purely, is for, as far as we understand, it's purely from geometry. Um, it's purely from the Doppler shift, from the transverse expansion that's coming from this asymmetric geometry. Yeah. Right. Now this yeah, would right. be different, this might be somewhat different at high PT. So if you go for high photon energy, because those, because those actually, um, there's not a lot of expansion yet when they are produced. So here you would be sensitive to any sort, sort of V2 you would have from initial fluctuations. Um, that's probably a small V2. It's unclear if you have a net, I'd have to think more if you have a net V2 or not. Uh, most likely it's just, you would, you'd have finite but small V2 coming from those initial fluctuations. Okay, okay, I guess it makes sense. So um, we don't see any other questions at this time. So I'll give maybe another second to to make sure that I didn't miss any raised hands. And with that, I think we will wrap the official part. I would like to thank you again for a very nice presentation and thank, thank everybody you. who who were able to attend this uh, colloquium.